So we just left off with finishing the definition of a product of two sets. Now we want to talk about what it means if they exist or if they're unique or anything like that. So let me just draw the diagram again and let me change the notation just slightly so that it's a little bit more easier to read. Let's call, um, I believe I had v before, let me call it u prime. So here I have the projections from u to x and y and from u prime to x and y. And we also had the existence of the unique function from u prime down to h. So here u is the product, is a product. So now we want to know if such a thing exists. And it turns out that the product, which we'll write as a triple, exists. And secondly, it's unique in the following sense. For any other product, such as, and now here we'll use the same notation as above, so we'll call it u prime, pi x prime, pi y prime, there exists an isomorphism, which is a bijection, between u and u prime. So let's call them, let's call this h inverse. And here I have h, such that pi prime of x is equal to the projection onto the first factor from the product and the projection onto the second product. So this is the sense in which it's unique. There's an isomorphism between the two. And we'll explain a little bit more about um, what that means for, for this. So let's first start by proving that such a thing exists. And existence might be a little bit easy for you to comprehend because you know what a product is already. So let's set u to be exactly what you think it should be, the usual Cartesian product of x and y. And we can also set the projection pi x of two elements, x comma y, to be just the first component. And similarly, pi y of x comma y should be the second component for all x, y in x cross y. Are we done with the proof? Not quite. We have to check to make sure that this satisfies this universal property, which means for any other u prime, for any other set u prime, together with maps to x and y, we have to make sure that there exists a unique map from u prime to u. So suppose we have such a u prime and these two projection maps. What should the map h be? So if u prime pi x prime pi y prime um, is uh, you know, exists, then set h of an element u prime to be, well, let's think a little bit about what we can possibly use. We know that we have a cross product here, and we know what the image of u prime is under the projection onto x, and we know what the image of u prime is onto the projection of y. So let's use those and map those into x cross y. So pi x prime of u prime and pi y prime of u prime for all u prime in u prime. So that's what we'll set h to be. Does it satisfy commutativity of this diagram, which means does this part of the diagram commute and does this part of the diagram commute? 
And you can see that it clearly does, because if I just take the projection onto the first factor, I get exactly the image um, over here. And similarly for the other side. So this checks the universality. And also, is h the only such function that does this? Um, and I'll leave that to you to think about. Uh, but it is true. So let's now check. So that actually concludes the proof of existence. Now let's check uniqueness. So now let's, let's use the same notation so that we don't have to draw everything over again. And now let's suppose that u prime is another product. So suppose u prime pi x prime pi y prime is another product. Again, of x and y. And what we want to do is we want to show that there's an isomorphism. Now, because u is a universal, is, is characterized by universal property, we know that we have such an h. Because u prime is in particular, has these maps to x and y, so we know that there exists a unique map to u. So by universality of u, and pi x and pi y, there exists a unique map h from u prime to u such that the required diagram commutes. Similarly, by universality of u prime, since we're assuming that u prime with its projections is also a product, there exists a unique h prime from u prime to u. So we have these two maps that go between u and u prime, and we want to show that these maps are in fact inverses of each other. So how can we do that? Well, if we look at this diagram and we merely uh, replace u prime with u instead, so we just have u and we have, so let me actually write this so that it's easy to see. So here u, u, x, and y. And then I have exactly these same projections. Well, by universality of u, there exists a unique map from here to here that makes this diagram commute. But what's the only thing such that when I precompose, I get exactly the same thing back? That's, that's precisely the identity. So this is the identity on u. But we also have another map that satisfies exactly the same condition. What is it? We can go through u prime by using h prime and h. Right? Here we have pi x, here we have pi y. And let's even draw these in here as well. Pi x prime, pi y prime. Now you can see why I needed to draw another picture because it gets a little cluttered. And we know that this, th everything here commutes. So this diagram commutes because um, by the universality of u prime. This part of the diagram commutes by universality of u prime as well. And these commute, oh, I forgot a prime here. Here it is. Um, and these commute by universality of u. But what else do we know is true by universality? So we know that this composition is equal to this one. But by the uniqueness from the universality condition, I know that this composition has to be exactly the same as this one. In other words, the identity at u by uniqueness. By uniqueness. From the universality for u, the identity at u equals h composed with h prime, which is precisely the definition of what it means to, for h and h prime to be inverses of each other. If you're not familiar with that uh, and you're familiar with the definition that it's a bijection, you should prove that h is a bijection if and only if there exists an h prime such that this is true and such that this is true.
and this follows by just replacing u with replacing um, u with u prime and flipping the primes around. And this actually finishes the proof. Now, what is this telling us? So first it tells us a couple of things. You might ask, okay, so I know that if I have two products, then they are isomorphic in some particular sense given by this theorem. And you can ask, okay, well, how many are there? Um, and it turns out that the number of such things is infinite. Uh, and you can see this by just fidgeting around a little bit. You can also just, for instance, flip these two around and maybe make, um, instead of choosing u to be x cross y, maybe you can choose u to be y cross x. And then just have the maps go the other way. Um, that should also be called the product, and it is. Uh, but you can also do other different changes that in no way, shape, or form change what it means to be a product. And that's why this universality condition is so important because what you might call the product, somebody else calls the product, and it might look a little bit different, but it satisfies all the same properties, and you would like to say that your two things are, in some sense, the same. And this is the sense in which they are the same. So we can say the product of x and y if we change what we mean by the word the. Okay, so that's one thing that I wanted to mention. And another important thing to note is that this tells us, for instance, this universality property tells us, for instance, that if we have a function that maps into a product, we get for free its component functions. So these component functions are precisely what happens when you compose. So now, ignoring the universal property, imagine we have a map from something, anything, into our product then we get for free the maps onto the components by composing with these projections. Conversely, and this is where the universality comes in, if I know what the component functions are, so now I'll draw those in pink here, if I have component functions, they don't have to be projections, they could be anything. If I have these component functions, then by the universality condition, there exists a unique map from my domain into the product. And this tells me that there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between maps into a product and maps into the corresponding factors. And this will be used time and time again throughout the course because we'll be dealing with functions on Euclidean space and not necessarily just functions of a single variable.